Okay, welcome back everyone for our final session of the day, uh, which is entitled From Berlin to Jerusalem. Uh, taken, as you probably already know, from the title of Gershom Sholem's, one of Gershom Sholem's two or three memoirs. Um, and so it's uh, a great pleasure now to, uh, to, let, to introduce to you uh, our head curator, who's going to be the moderator for this session, Francesco Spagnolo, who is, um, in addition to being the head curator, is also an associate adjunct professor in the Department of Music and the Center for Jewish Studies, uh, and is affiliated with the Berkeley uh, Center for the Study of Religion, the Institute for European Studies, Middle Eastern Studies and Religious Diversity Cluster of the Haas Institute. Um, He's a man of multiple talents just by his affiliate, as we can tell by his affiliations uh, and of his publications, of which there are quite a number, but I would just list Italian music, uh, Jewish musical traditions, uh, of which I was the uh, personal or my family was the personal beneficiary some years ago when we had him to our place for Seder and uh, we heard uh, tunes of familiar songs that we had never heard before and they were very beautiful and uh, the Jewish world 100 treasures of art and culture which came out in 2014 um, Francesco also hosts cultural programs for Italian national radio it is a scholar in residence with the Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra in San Francisco um, he is uh, uh, as I said yesterday, the sort of, you know, the artistic and creative spark and has been for many years behind the Magnus, uh, heavily, deeply instrumental in bringing us the Magnus, uh, in bringing to the Magnus, the Vishniak uh, collection, um, but has uh, put on something in the order of uh, 30 individual exhibitions, 200 public programs, um, you know, of, of, of very diverse kinds and subjects. And that's the thing, this is not a repetition of sort of the one thing in a different key, but they're all very, very different. And uh, it speaks to his uh, creativity and uh, what I think is a great sense of imagination. Uh, and it's been uh, my pleasure in my year here uh, at the Magnus uh, to work with him in very close contact on a daily basis. So one of the privileges of the job. And I will now turn it over to Francesco to introduce uh, our speakers. John, the, the pleasure is mutual. And it's also a delight to introduce this last panel. This has been a very, very uh, illuminating conference so far. And we're now opening a new chapter in our exploration because we, and, and in some ways, I think it's, it's almost the first chapter in uh, the study of lesser known or unknown uh, work by Roman Vishniak. Um, our two presenters, Aubrey Pomerantz and Rebecca Grossman, will respectively discuss Berlin and Jerusalem. Uh, quite appropriately, Rebecca is joining us from Jerusalem. So good evening, Rebecca. And Aubrey was coming from Berlin, but he's actually right now sitting, I think, at the Magnus, in, yes. in one of the rooms of the Magnus in, in Berkeley, uh, California. So it's really a delight to have you both. Um, I was, I, I was saying it's, it's, it's a first chapter because uh, as we have heard from many panelists, a lot of focus has been uh, devoted to the Central East European uh, photographs. Uh, but as we learned, Roman Vishnik lived in Berlin for 20 years and, and really lived there when he conceived his work in Eastern Europe. And as we will learn with Rebecca in 1967, he, was, uh, he actually went on some kind of scouting expedition around Israel and uh, covered all of Israel in his photographs in color. Um, I, when, when the collection came in, I, I did devote some attention to processing specifically these materials because I, I felt they could open a new, a new door on, on, on the work of Roman Vizniak. So without further ado, I'm just going to introduce the first speaker, um, Aubrey Pomerantz, who is going to speak about Roman Vizniak, the Berlin years. Um, Aubrey is head of the archives at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. He was born in Calgary, Canada, and studied Jewish studies and history at the Freie Universität in Berlin. And there he was a research assistant in the Institute for uh, Judaistic in 1995, 1996, and thereafter at Salomon Luffy Steinham Institute for German Jewish History in Duisburg. In April 2001, he took up his position at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, and we've been in touch over the years because uh, 
there are so many different synergies between the Magnus collection and the Jewish Museum in Berlin. And I know you've been collecting in, uh, in the Bay Area, collecting, documenting German Jewish history in the area in California, and the Magnus has done that as well in, in years past in its collaboration with the Bancroft Library at uh, the UC Berkeley campus. And he's responsible for the establishment of a branch of the archives of the Leo Beck Institute and for the museum's archival collection. In 2005, Aubrey, which is the reason he's invited to speak uh, here today, Aubrey curated the first ever exhibition devoted to Vishnev's Berlin photographs at the Jewish Museum Berlin and co-edited the accompanying publication together with Jim Fraser and Maria Vishnev Kohn, who had donated a cache of original photographs and negatives to the Jewish Museum Berlin that I assume inspired the, 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 the exhibition and the, and the companion book that's a very precious precious volume. The exhibition was shown at three smaller venues in the United States in 2007. And in 2008, he also curated the first exhibition on the photography of Ruth Jacobi, the little known sister of renowned photographer Lotte Jacobi. And more recently, he was part of the curatorial team that put together the new permanent exhibition at the Jewish Museum Berlin. Here too, we have synergies with the Magnus because a very important painting from the Magnus came and joined your permanent exhibition, at least in the first years, I know you're sending it back at some point. So we'll <laughs> happily receive the Oppenheim painting with Moses Mendelssohn in his study uh, back to the Magnus at one point. And, uh, but we exhibited at the Magnus also and, and did interesting work with it. So happy to, to know it's there at this time. He's co-curated co a segment devoted to the lives and fates of Jews in Germany during the period of National Socialism and the digital world presenting family collections. He's written on Jewish memorial culture, Jewish photographers in Berlin, Jewish life in Nazi Germany. Aubrey Pomeranz speaking today uh, in our symposium on Roman Vishniak, spelled W-I-S-C-H-N-I-A-C-K in the German uh, spelling of the last name, the Berlin years. Thank you, Aubrey. Thank you very much, Francesco. Um, So I think we're good with the, uh, very good. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesco, for your very uh, friendly introduction. And I wanna thank both you and John very, very much for the invitation to participate in today's symposium. Um, as you heard from Francesco, I am sitting at the Magnus and it's very lonely without all of you here. Very strange being a, uh, a stranger uh, in this wonderful, wonderful house. But as Francesco said, there's lots of connections between our two institutions, which now through the Vishniak uh, and collection can only grow and prosper further. I'd like to begin my presentation with two allusions to Roman Vishniak's years in Berlin. The first is to be found in my title, in which the Vishniak name is spelled in German as it appeared not only in the Berlin telephone books between the years 1922 and 1939, but also on all of Roman's official documents, on a few vintage prints, and in the captions accompanying the small number of photographs published during, during his later years in the city. Whereas this spelling of the family name is a rather obvious reference to Vishniak's time in the German capital, the, images of, the image of him enjoying a beverage will, I suspect, only be recognizable to insiders as being classic Berlin. Most likely a self-portrait, it shows him drinking a Berliner Weisse, a cloudy sour wheat, wheat beer served in the wide pressed glass receptacle produced for this particular drink. For decades after his departure from Berlin, and indeed for many years following his passing in 1990, the photographs that Roman Vishniak took in and of the city that was home to his family for almost two decades remained almost entirely unknown to the public at large. They were in fact only discovered following his death by his daughter Mara and her close friend, James Fraser, who assisted her in sorting through Roman's apartment on New York's Upper West Side. They turned up at the bottom drawer of a four drawer filing cabinet, standing near Roman's desk in a bundle of folders and envelopes tied with a cord and marked Berlin. Later, further prints from the Berlin years were found among uh, stored and forgotten materials in the New York apartment of Roman's first wife, Luta. In 2004, a large portion of the Berlin materials were donated by Mara Vishniak Kohn to the Jewish Museum Berlin. 
The collection comprises of some 100 vintage and later prints produced by Roman and of laboratory prints made in the 1990s, as well as 1,500 negatives and over 70 contact sheets. In October 2005, the exhibition Roman Wischniak's Berlin was held at the museum in which 90 photographs from Roman's Berlin years were displayed. We were honored by the presence of Mara Wischniak, seen here pointing to an iconic picture that her father had taken of her in Berlin. Together with her husband, Walter Cohn, and her son, Ben Schiff, and his family. It was wonderful to see Ben here in Berkeley yesterday and to listen to his wonderful presentation today. The exhibition and accompanying publication, both in German and English editions, presented for the first time a body of work that revealed many new aspects of Roman's work. A sizable number of the Berlin photographs figured prominently in the exhibition Roman Wischniak Rediscovered, staged by the International Center of Photography in New York in 2013, and which traveled, as we have also heard. Um, and I hope they will also be on display here at the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life in the very, new, very near future. Um, and it was conspicuous that in the presentation of the photographs that have been digitized that were on display here yesterday in the hall and that everybody's been watching in the loop, that the Berlin photographs um, pre-1939 were absent. So um, everything that I'm going to be showing you is very new. Um, the discovery, exhibition, and publication of many of Vishniak's photographs taken in and around Berlin and the research that has coincided with it has greatly enhanced our knowledge of a master photographer of the 20th century and added to our appreciation of his genius. Roman Wischniak, as we have already heard, arrived in Berlin from Riga in November of 1920, together with his fiancée, actually wife, they probably were married in a ceremony at a train station in Latvia, Luta Bag. His parents had already left Moscow in 1918 or 19, fleeing the upheaval, chaos, and dangers brought about by the revolution and the Russian Civil War. The earliest known photograph that we have of Roman in the German capital was taken of him and Luta on the occasion of their Jewish wedding ceremony that took place at the Bene Bridge Lodge on Kleiststrasse on December 2nd, 1920. The couple settled into a comfortable flat on the corner of Parisa and Sächsische Straße in an apartment building that had been purchased by the Wischniak and Bag families. Here they would remain for nearly 18 years and it was here that they would raise their children, Wolf and Mara, born in 1922 and 1926. And it was here in the immediate surroundings that Roman would take countless photographs. Salomon Wischniak, however, as Ben has told us, had hoped that his son would go into business and in 1923 established the Excelsior typewriter and automobile factory. Here a self-portrait of Roman from 1923 who never learned to drive a car but this turned out to be a short-lived affair. Following further unsuccessful attempts to make a businessman out of him, Roman was able to pursue his scientific and other interests, among them Asian art and, of course, photography. And uh, we should be reminded that he had arrived in Berlin with a doctorate in zoology and had also completed um, this, a, a medical study, medicine studies and also biology without a final degree. From a hitherto overlooked source, the memoirs of Felicia Guggenheim, penned at the beginning of the 1990s, we learn that Roman pursued his passion for photography together with her brother, Norbert Weinbaum, whom he had met shortly after his arrival in Berlin and with whom he became a close friend. The two young men took courses to broaden their understanding of the camera. Fe Felicia Guggenheim added that Roman had more time and interest than her brother, who was a practicing dentist. Vishniak's ensuing photographic work taken over the following years encompasses images of family and friends, of daily street scenes and of surrounding areas, of animals and nature, of a considerable number of photographs of Jewish institutions, and of course, his microscopic photography. The latter, however, barely being represented in the collection house at the Jewish Museum Berlin. Many of the earliest surviving photographs are ones of Roman's family. This picture taken on the first anniversary of his and Luta's wedding includes Russian emigrate artists, musicians, publishers, and bankers, some of them relatives of the Vishniak and Bag families, 
and illustrates how well ingrained the Vishniak family was in the Russian emigre community. A favorite motif of Roman's was the Litvas Soyle, the eponymous advertising pillar created by Ernst Litvas in Berlin in the 1850s and a symbol of the city to this day. Here we, are, here we see Roman's father and his son Wolf in a photo taken in 1925. And on the right, we see a uh, self-portrait of Roman taken some years later in 1931. Several wonderful photographs also exist of and from the Vishniak apartment building, as well as Im images taken in their flat. And uh, these images are very, very interesting because in some respects they foreshadow images that Roman took in Eastern Europe, because there are a lot of photographs where they're taken also uh, during rainfall or sleet or snow. And it's very interesting to see these photographs from the 20s foreshadowing those. And here are two photographs taken on Hanukkah 1934 inside the Vishniak apartment at a Hanukkah party for Mara and a number of friends of hers. On the left-hand side, we see a Hanukkah puppet show. And to the left of that, we see a portrait that was taken of Roman's uh, grandfather, um, um, Wolf Vishniak, uh, who his son is named after. As we've heard um, from other speakers, Roman was enamored by creatures large and small. And throughout his years in Berlin, he took images and photographs of many animals. Um, in the apartment itself, there was an aquarium room in which there were stacks of terrariums, in which housed many, many reptiles. There are no photographs of those. But I've included two photographs, uh, the one on the left uh, taken at the Berlin Zoo and the one on the right. And here we've spoken a lot or we've heard a lot about captions and Roman added captions to both of these photographs on the left. It was called Menschen hinter Gitter, people behind bars. And on the right, he entitled uh, this wonderful photograph, Married Life. Um, so we really get a fine feeling for the humor in which Roman both took photographs and then uh, captioned them later on. And he often had multiple different captions for various different uh, photographs. And the photograph on the left of the bears is a beloved, uh, a, a beloved perspective that you find also from other photographers. Judging from the very limited number of formal portraits contained in the collection, here are those of the famous singer Josef Schmidt, who was a good friend of the family taken around 1931 and of the playwright and theater critic Julius Bob, photographed a year later, it would seem that Vishniak merely tried his hand at this genre in Berlin, which become much more prevalent during his early years in New York. In Berlin, Vishniak photographed a number of immediately recognizable landmarks. The Alexanderplatz with Peter Behrens' modernist masterpiece, the Berlin Berolina House, in which we also see the Jewish-owned Wertheim department store, and a separate image of the Berolina statue created by Emil Hundrisser in 1895. Others include the Café Kranzler on Unter den Linden and the Charlottenburger Bridge. It is, however, his photographs of people on the streets and of Berlin characters that fascinate most. Vishniak was a true flaneur, a passionate spectator, as the poet Charles Baudelaire described the term. Among the pictures he took of the persons and street life he encountered, he seemed particularly captivated by individuals engaged in their professions outdoors, chimney sweeps and asphalt layers, beer wagon drivers and window cleaners, Newspaper sellers and firemen were captured by his lens, and the resulting images reveal the very kindly view that Roman had of his subjects. He also enjoyed observing and capturing passersby from within doorways, and the resulting photographs show him to be a master of the moment, none more so than the comical image that Roman gave the title Recalcitrance, but also. Der Hund ist anderer Meinung. The dog is of a different opinion. Similarly charming is a photo taken in a Kellerkneipe, a basement pub that displays Vishniak's feeling for light and shadows, also evidenced in an entrancing picture taken at the Anhalter Bahnhof. Although a number of these photographs reveal modernist elements, such as bird's eye views, backlighting, and angular perspectives, Vishniak, in my, in my opinion, 
clearly did not have a modernist agenda. We have no record of Vishniak having been in contact with any of the numerous protagonists of modern photography in Berlin, nor of expressing any particular interest in the various trends and developments taking place of which he surely must have been aware. The number of images taken on Berlin streets following the transfer of power to the National Socialists in January 1933 and in the ensuing years until the departure of the Vishniaks from the German capital in the first months of 1939 is much smaller. The new reality is starkly captured in a few photographs that Roman took of his daughter Mara in November of 1933. In the photo on the left, he has positioned her next to a Litfaßsäule, on which we see a poster for a charity festival of the Sturmabteilung Truppe Berlin-Brandenburg and one for the winter aid effort that includes an illustration of a uniformed Nazi. And I want to point out an advertisement for the Jewish owned shoot chain Liza can also be seen on the Litfaßsäule. The image on the right shows her in front of a store window out with a poster of Hitler and Vice President Hindenburg with the audacious caption, fight with us for freedom and equal rights. And one calling upon people to vote yes in the referendum to withdraw the country from the League of Nations. In a further image, Mara is standing in front of a shop window which is advertising the plastometer, an anatomical instrument created and used to measure the human skull in order to differentiate, differentiate Aryans from non-Aryans. None of Vishniak's later images capture so poignantly the political circumstances of the times. A powerful image taken in 1934 of a changing of the guard at the Neue Wache, which since 1931 had become the memorial for the fallen soldiers of the World War, shows the German cathedral shrouded in fog and has a rather ominous feel to it. Yet this photograph would not have looked any different if taken in the years immediately before the National Socialists came to power. As a street photographer, as can be sensed here, Vishniak now maintained a greater distance from his subjects. Gone is the previously palpable, sympathetic view of them as, as exemplified by this photograph of a group of pedestrians crossing the street near Wittenbergplatz, taken around the time of the Summer Olympics in July of 1936. If you look on the very right-hand edge of the photograph, you can see the Olympic rings. A particularly significant development in Vishniak's photographic activities in the first years of Nazi rule was his participation in the Zionist amateur photo group named Tmuna that was founded in February 1934. The primary goals of Tmuna, which is a Hebrew word for picture or photograph, were elucidated in a short article appearing in the Zionist newspaper Yudisha Rundschau to put photography in the service of Jewish national education, to make the treasures of the Jewish Museum Berlin known to wider circles through photographic reproduction, to study with the camera, the Jewish human type, the festivals, documents of the Jewish past in Germany, and Jewish sociology. The article mentions Roman's friend Norbert Weinbaum as one of the secretaries of the new photographic group, and there is good reason to assume that it was through him that Vishniak became involved with the group. The first evidence of his participation stems from September and October of 1935 in the form of an announcement of lectures he gave on Asian art as a guide for artistic photography, at which he also showed images. Photographs pertaining to Asian art are absent from the Vishniak collection at the Jewish Museum Berlin. But in this image taken of Var Mara Vishniak at the end of 1934, in conjunction with the Hanukkah party that we saw previously, we see such artworks in the Vishniak apartment, also some which were described by Ben in his presentation, and we know that Roman was both an expert on the subject and an avid collector. Further lectures given by Vishniak within the framework of Tmuna were entitled Athletic and Spiritual Experience in the High Mountain Region and its Representation in Photography. Here's some related images from the collection, although, of course, I don't know if these images were actually shown. And another lecture called Schnappschüsse, das fotografierte Leben, Schna snapshots, photographed life. In his presentation of the latter subject, Vishniak would surely have drawn upon the treasure trove of photographs that he had taken on the streets of Berlin over the previous decade. 
and one can only speculate as to what images he may have shown. And this is one of my favorites, the repair of a Litfas Soiler um, in the Malberger Straße taken in 1931. No notes or lists pertaining to any of the talks he gave as a member of Tzmuna have survived. And indeed, there is no indication that he later referred in any form to his years long involvement with the group. How interesting it would be to know more about his relationships to some of the other photographers involved with the group, such as Paul Knocher, who in 1925 published a book entitled Introduction to X-ray Photography that Roman, as a pioneer of microphotography, very likely would have been familiar with. The young portrait photographer, Thea Prince, who is also recorded as having given a presentation at Tmuna, was the sister of the well-known rabbi Joachim Prince, who had officiated at the bar mitzvah of Roman San Wolf in 1935. And Fritz Eschen, the photojournalist with whom Roman discussed the relationship between art and photography at a further event staged by Tmuna and whom he met after the war when he returned to Berlin in 1947. It is conspicuous that Roman's aforementioned presentations within the confines of Tmuna, a further one dealt with romanticism in photography. We've heard of Roman being a romantic. Um, and here we see um, also some images. Uh, other, I'm sorry, the, the, the title was Romanticism in Photography, The Wonder of Sunlight, uh, pertaining to which there are many striking images in Roman's estate. It's, con it's conspicuous that these talks had absolutely nothing to do with Jewish life to which the group was ostensibly devoted, as stated in the announcement of its formation. We later read, however, that another major goal of Tuna was to train through the presentation of technical and aesthetic content and to educate to see artistically. And it is clearly to this end that Roman's lectures and indeed the overwhelming majority of the group's events were focused. And in the announcements of Roman's talks, he is then um, identified as the photographer, Dr. Roman Vishniak, so one of the professionals amongst a group of amateurs. That said, at around the same time that Roman was speaking about Asian art, snapshots, and the wonder of sunlight, talks that underline the diversity of his photographic undertakings and expertise, he had indeed begun to take pictures of Jewish life in Berlin. The presumably earliest such photographs were taken at the Ort School in 1935, the vocational institute of the Organization for Rehabilitation Through Training that was founded in St. Petersburg in 1880. The connection here might very well have to do with Romans having been a member of the Ort board already in the late 1920s in Berlin. Individual photographs taken at, taken at other institutions over the following two years include this image of boys from a Zionist youth group renovating a room in the building on Meinecke Straße that housed many Zionist organizations and where the photo group Tmuna met in its first year. And I'd like to add that both of Vishniak's children were members of Zionist youth groups, both Hashomer Atzair and Mara of the Werkleute. A further image was taken at the office of the American Jewish Joint Distri Distribution Committee, who, of course, commissioned Roman to photograph Jewish communities in Eastern Europe. The first series of photographs that Roman took of a Jewish institution, portrayed pupils at the Jewish middle school in the Gose Hamburger Straße, which housed the largest number of pupils of any Jewish school in Berlin. And Jeffrey had also shown one of these images earlier. It is at this time that a small number of images taken by Vishniak were first published, but surprisingly, not photographs of Zionist youth or Jewish educational institutions, but of paintings that were on display at the Jewish Museum Berlin in the exhibition Unsere Ahnen, Our Ancestors. Open in November 1936, the show presented over 150 portraits dating from the second half of the 18th century and into the 1900s and was the most successful exhibition staged by the museum in the span of its short six years in existence. Roman's photos of portraits painted by Maya Michelson, Kurt Neil, and Hermann Nelke appeared in the periodicals Jüdische Rundschau and the Gemeindeblatt der Jüdische Gemeinde zu Berlin. As it turns out, 
this was not the only time that Vishniak took, took photographs at the museum. As I revisited the negatives in preparation for our symposium, I was delighted to find one strip of negatives with images taken at the museum in which the prominent art historian Rahel Wichnitzer Bernstein and Dr. Alfred Clay, chairman of the Zionist Association of Germany and deputy chairman of the Association of Jewish Museum, can be seen. These pictures were taken at an exhibition dedicated to the work of Ernst and Alexander Opler that opened at the museum in October 1937, works of whom can be seen in the background. What I found additionally striking was that the fact that an image of the same event taken by Abraham Pesarek, uh, a photographer who was born in uh, Przezbyrz near Lodz and came to Berlin in 1918 or 1919 and then studied photography in Berlin after returning from Palestine at the end of the 1920s, um, and who alongside Herbert Sonnenfeld took the largest number of photographs of Jewish life institutions in Nazi Germany, of which hundreds were published in the German Jewish newspapers, uh, though not this particular image. The discovery that Vishniak and Pizarro took photographs at the same event strengthened my long held belief that they must have known one another, even though no sources exist to substantiate this assumption. In any case, in an article on the exhibition, their images appear together on the same page. Left, a photograph from Pizarek, left and also center in the page, and right, a photograph from Roman Vishniak. Roman was thus clearly on the move as a photographer in Jewish Berlin. And at this, and this at the same time that he was traveling regularly from Berlin to the east to document Jewish life in Poland, Lithuania, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Carpathian Ruthenia. In view of Vishniak's regular involvement with Tmuna, it may come as no great surprise that it was at a further lecture of his that photographs he had taken in Eastern Europe were presented publicly for the first time, a fact, however, that remained undiscovered until 2005. Roman's talk uh, was given on March 23rd, 1937, and it was entitled Munkach, Jüdische Stadt in der Zerstreuung, Jewish City in the Diaspora. Seven months later, a second presentation followed under the heading Jewish Life in Poland. Interestingly, his photographs from the East had apparently been shown previous to both these presentations at Roman's apartment for family and friends as testified to in Felice Guggenheim's memoir. It was, however, through their first display within the framework of an exhibition put together by Tmuna in January of 1938, that they made a broader impact. In a review of this show entitled Altes Leben, Neues Leben, Old Life, New Life, that strove to contrast the Eastern European Jewish milieu with the rhythm of life in Palestine and also portray Zionist activities in Germany, Vishniak's photographs were particularly highlighted. I quote, the quality of the photographs of the exhibition is by no means uniform, but there are many strong impressions, the most lasting of which are clearly the images taken by Dr. Roman Vishniak in Poland and Carpatho, Russia, in which the misery and despair of the Jewish streets are captured in a harrowing and truly artistic manner. Artisans, merchants, women, children, yeshiva bachurim, all the vibrant life is revealed here in snapshots taken with admirable certainty always shot at the right moment, end of quote. The exhibition was shown at a, se a second time in May of 1938 in the foyer of the theater of the Jüdische Kulturbund, the Jewish Cultural League, of which the Vishniaks were members. And here's a image of the membership card of Roman and his son Wolf, where it was most certainly seen by a much larger audience in the Kulturbund. A further reviewer, was equally enthralled by Roman's work. And I quote again, on the first floor, one is struck by Dr. Roman Vishniak's exceptionally powerful photographs from Poland and Carpathia, Russia. One sees the world of Hasidim, Jewish peasants, village Jews, people in the Cheda, in the Yeshiva, studying the doctrine, as well as those whose condition reminds us with all clarity of Jewish fate in Galut, end of quote. Regrettably, no images of this exhibition are known to exist, and indeed our knowledge of the photogroup Tmuna 
is to date limited to the short articles about it and the announcements of its activities in the German Jewish press. And yet the significance of Roman's involvement therein can certainly not be underestimated. Might it be possible that this affiliation played some role in Roman being commissioned to photograph Eastern European Jewish communities? More likely, perhaps, is that it had something to do with him photographing a small number of further Jewish institutions in Berlin following the extremely positive reception of his images from Eastern Europe. Among these were a vocational training facility in Niederschönhausen, here a vintage, um, uh, and also apparently also a Jewish hospital. In 1938, after the, uh, after the exhibition was shown at the Kulturbund, Vishniak also photographed children at the Teitelsche Kinder and Jugendheim. That was founded in 1928 to care for the children of refugees from Russia, and that after 1933, children from German Jewish families also attended. Of all the photographs that Roman Vishniak took of Jewish institutions in and near Berlin, only a single one taken at the Kinder and Jugendheim was published on June 2, 1938, in an article in the Zeifau Zeitung marking the 10th anniversary of the institution. The most extensive documentation of a Jewish institution undertaken by Vishniak in the same year was of the agricultural training farm of Gutwinkel, located just outside of Berlin to the southeast. Founded in 1927 by the department store owner Simon Schocken, it served as a Zionist Hachshara until 1941, preparing young Jews for a new life in Palestine. Vishniak photographed the wide spectrum of activities undertaken there, work in the fields and in the kitchen, the care of farm animals, the gathering of eggs, the early morning assembly. Roman clearly valued the photographs taken at Gutwinkel, as two of them, these two shown here, were published in the Vanish World publication of 1983. And the only other two photographs taken in Germany that appeared in a vanished world were two photographs of Mara, one in front of the uh, Litvasole and the other one in front of uh, one of the shop windows that I showed previously. While the photographs of the Kinderheim, schools and Hachsharot depict happy children and youth, the latter preparing for a, a better future, images taken at the Aid Association of German Jews are far more somber portraying middle-aged and older individuals seeking advice and assistance in their efforts to emigrate, photographs that reflect the anxiety that they were experiencing. Whether Vishniak's photographs of Jewish institutions in Berlin were indeed formally commissioned remains unknown, as there is, to the best of my knowledge, no documentary evidence that this was indeed the case. Interesting that there are images taken at Gutwinkel that are to be found in the Schocken family archive, but not among the materials at the Jewish Museum Berlin, and I suspect that they are probably not part of the collection here at the Magnus. As such, it is possible that these images done at Gutwinkel were created on the behest of the Schockens and not an assignment by an organization of the Jewish, community Berlin, uh, the Jewish community in Berlin. And as we've seen, only one single photograph was ever published, so one would have to question uh, what would be the, the, the purpose of commissioning Roman to photograph images if they were never used and never came to the fore. Many of Vishniak's images of the Jewish institutions in Berlin are, to be sure, compelling. But when we view them in hindsight, they do not evoke the same sense of fascination and loss generated by his photographs of Jewish life in the East, and nor do they have the intimacy of most of those photographs. Perhaps it was the tremendously positive reaction to the latter in 1938, combined with the ardent response to them in later years, that for Roman himself overshadowed the photographs that he had taken of Jewish life in Berlin? Or might he have valued these less in light of the fact that other photographers, first and foremost, Abraham Pizarek and Herbert Sonnenfeld, the latter who also exhibited at the Tmuana exhibition of 1938, 
had in their work for the Jewish press quite thoroughly documented Jewish life in the German capital between 1933 and 1938, and in Pizarro's case, up until 1941. By contrast, Vishniak was most definitely aware of the uniqueness of his project in Eastern Europe. And it is reasonable to assume that he saw the communities he encountered there to have been more vulnerable than the Jews in Berlin. Vishniak and his family had experienced Nazi rule in Germany from day one. And although they as Latvian citizens for quite some time suffered less from the anti-Semitic measures the regime introduced as attested to later by Luta Vishniak in a, uh, in a uh, Wiedergutmachungsantrag uh, in a restitution uh, case, they naturally experienced the discrimination and segregation of the Jewish population. Uh, I know that Mara attended, was taken out of, uh, out of a public school and put into two uh, private Jewish schools. As such, he and his family also belonged to a vanishing world, but one that for the reasons mentioned, he never undertook to document with the same devotion with which his lens focused on the last years of Jewish life in the East that through his work would become the vanished world. And it is extremely interesting to note that Roman undertook no efforts to photograph Eastern European Jews who were identifiably Eastern European Jews in Berlin, neither in the 20s nor in the later times. It is certainly possible that amongst the photographs of individuals taken at Jewish institutions that there were Jews there of Eastern European descent, but not identifiable. And it is particularly interesting that on one of Roman's very last assignments, he did photograph Eastern European Jews who had lived in Germany, but who were deported at the end of October 1938 uh, in the so-called Poland Aktion, 17,000 Jews of Polish nationality, 8,000 of whom then ended up in the Polish border town of Zbonshin. And Roman went there probably just a few days after the arrival of initially 8,000 refugees, of whom 5,000 remained for months afterwards, and took um, some photographs of the refugees there, um, some of them which became then also iconic images. And um, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I suspect that that was probably, if not the last time, one of the very last times that uh, he was in Poland in October of 1938. And of course, it was only after Kristallnacht, November of 1938, that uh, Roman and his family started to reconsider uh, leaving Germany. Some more images of the Hillsfeld. Some two decades after departing Berlin, Vishniak revisited a large part of the surviving body of work that he had created in the city over a period of nearly two decades. And we can assume that like the photographs taken in the East, he was unable to get many of his Berlin images out of Europe as well. A list of photographs along with the dates they were purportedly taken, at the top of which we read book in German, along with a second list of captions, indicate that he had considered publishing and perhaps also exhibiting many of these. Some of the contact sheets also reveal choices of images he had made. We do not know why this project never came to fruition and why in the end the Berlin photographs were relegated to the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet. Their reemergence has provided us with a far more complete understanding of Vishniak's oeuvre and of the crucial years in his development as a photographer. But as I hope to have shown, there are still questions to be asked and new discoveries to be made. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Aubrey. And um, I know I have some questions for you and we're all gonna hold questions for the, for the end of the panel after we hear from Rebecca, but I invite everybody to use the Q&A button at the bottom of their Zoom window to, to submit questions for you. Um, I suspect that he was actually in Krakow at the very end of 1938, possibly even January of 39, but that's, that's, that's for, a, for, a, for another conversation. And, but from one unpublished project to another possibly, um, in, uh, in the late summer of 1967, um, 
Roman Vishniak and his, uh, and his wife Edith travel to Israel and visit Jerusalem that is going through tremendous upheaval at the end of the Six Day War and being reconfigured in its urban uh, structure. Um, it took photographs, it took slides, um, transparencies uh, in color uh, across, the, across the country and beyond, uh, the, the traveling into, into Sinai and, and looking at Jordan and so on. And uh, this whole cache of, of, of images is one that I, I decided to invest some energy early on in when they, the archive reached uh, AC Berkeley and the Magnus. And, and so um, I'm the one who copied all of the little inscriptions on the, on the, um, on the frames of the, of, the, of the slides and then worked on digitizing them with a team of students. And now they were made available to you, Rebecca, for uh, your uh, consideration and, and, and reflections. Rebecca Grossman, um, it's wonderful to have you. In, uh, today in our, in, our, in our symposium. Rebecca is a postdoctoral fellow at the Jacob Robinson Center for the History of Individual and Collective Rights at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her research focuses on the intersection of Jewish politics, migratory mobility, and global visual culture. Before joining the Jacob Robinson Center, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Franz Rosenzweig Minerva Center, Research Center for German Jewish Literature and Cultural History at Hebrew University as well. And also she was at the Pacific Regional Office of the German Historical Institute at the University of California, Berkeley, which is where we met and where I started showing you a little bit. It was, it was just the time when the materials were arriving. So I started showing you a little bit of the photographic moldings of, of the Magnus and her work has been supported by the George Moss Program in History, the Jack Joseph and Martha Mandel School for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at Hebrew University and the Leo Beck Fellowship Program. Aspects of her research have been published in Jewish Social Studies, the Leo Beck Institute Yearbook and Israel Studies. And Rebecca is going to speak about Vishniak in Israel. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francesco. I'm just going to um share my screen. All right. This should be it. You should be seeing it now. Okay, again, thank you so much, Francesca, and also uh, to John and everybody who made this event possible. I am um, honored to be with you tonight to learn from you and also uh, to share some of my insights of this Israel collection of Vishniak with you. And um, I will take you with me to Israel, where I'm currently uh, at. I'm located here, and I'm uh, a bit sad that I cannot join you uh, at Berkeley, but um, Zoom makes it possible for me to join you here. And um, I, I don't only take you into Israel right now, but also with Vishniak, um, and together we'll be traveling um, sort of uh, on his traces or his footsteps through the country. When um, Roman Vishniak visited Israel in the summer of 1967, the Sixth Day War had just ended. He was 70 years old at the time and he had made careers in a variety of photographic fields at, as we just heard today. And uh, yet this trip to Israel was anything but a trip of a pensioner. Instead, he traveled the entire country and documented it with his camera and taking more than 450 color photographs of this trip. A photograph of him actually taken by his wife Edith on Mount Scopus is representative of this collection in many ways. The sun is in a state of transition, probably about to set and coloring the Jerusalem stone and the ground orange and pink. The university building peeks out from beyond the trees. Vishniak himself stands on some sort of empty ground. His head is tilted and he seems solemn and pensive. And this long angle makes him appear very small and almost somewhat lost amidst these rubbles of an area that has in fact not seen visitors for almost 20 years because between 1948 and 1967, Mount Scopus had been a no man's land. It was an enclave in which important national institutions, including the Hebrew University that we see here, but also the National Library and the Hadassah Hospital had lain abandoned. Yehuda Michai in his surreal 1963 novel, Not of This Time, Not of This Place, 
would describe this area as a forgotten and abandoned world. And he would let his protagonist, Joel, die on these grounds by stepping on a landmine. The institutions had then subsequently after 1948 been moved to new buildings in uh, the western part of the city. And so this was really uh, an omen's land and abandoned. Now, after the war of 1967, all this is suddenly accessible again. And it is telling of Vishniak's understanding of the conflict and the war that he did not miss to visit Mount Scopus and actually turned it into one of the more important sites to be seen in this Israel collection of his. The university building peeks out through the trees, timid somewhat and yet to retain the meaning it has once had. The picture is characteristic of Vishniak's collection and it suggests that the series uh, is somewhat different from many other of his works. In one aspect, however, it comes close to the other series that we know of Vishniak. It shares a particular awareness of the transitory nature of the spaces he passes through. We find this awareness, of course, especially in the collection taken in the late 1930s in Eastern Europe. But while the liminality of his Eastern European photographs conjures somewhat of a retrospective gaze back taken before a war, the Second World War, Vishniak's Israel images taken just after another war seem to speak to the transient character of the present moment and actually even glancing into the future. And this impression is stringent, strengthened by the fact that this collection is all in color, even though color, as we will see, does not unambiguously speak of future or progress, but it also allows Vishniak to connect with the past. Engaging with this collection is fascinating, as Francesco has already said, because in a way it combines many of uh, Vishniak's life's work and many of the traces of earlier series. In fact, to me, it almost offers uh, a synthesis of his earlier works. I want to say that this is possible largely due to the work of Francesco and Chico Javi and their students who made sure to catalog this as one of the first uh, uh, series of Vishniak's collection. And it is actually open to all of you uh, to browse. So after this, uh, feel free to, to explore more of this collection. In discussing this collection, I want to give a brief glimpse into what this summer of 1967 meant for both Israeli photography and the public image of Israel to then locate Vishniak's visit and his photography in this story. Vishniak's gaze was certainly influenced by the historic moment of the Six Day War, but at the same time, it tells its very own story of how this country was to be seen. The Six Day War had, of course, a major impact on the way Israel was captured and seen in 1967. For several weeks, uh, the war was um, visible all over the world, for example, covered by Life, Life magazine. It was, of course, a war that um, entailed considerable gains for Israel and was as such interesting to onlookers all over the world. 17 photographers uh, covered the war for Life magazine. And we see them here in an issue published uh, on June 23rd. So there on this one page, there are 16 of them, among them Cornell Kappa and David Rubinger. And they are prominently introduced as facing, and I quote, artillery shellings, machine gun fire, bombings, sniper bullets, arrest and confinement. One of these photographers had been given an extra portrait in the previous issue, Paul Schutzer, the 36-year-old war reporter, while riding across Gaza, had been hit by an Egyptian anti-tank missile and died on one of the first days of this very short war, attesting to the fact that these photographers were ready to sacrifice their life in writing photo history. In July 1967, then, William Stevenson published the illustrated account Strike Zion, and he called it 
the on-the-spot story of Israel's spectacular six-day battle for survival. And you can see here that it is additionally promoted by Leon Uris, whose exodus had helped to illustrate the ideal of Zionist renewal to American audiences. So the whole imagery of the Six Day War is loaded with emotion and triumph. Wars in the Middle East had always attracted photographers who had, through their presence and their works, written both the history of the region and uh, photo history. One of the first conflicts to be documented by photojournalists in the territory of, of Palestine had been the national clashes of 1929. Tim Gidal, then a young photographer of 21 years, had covered the aftermath of the clashes for the Munich Illustrated Press and some other papers, providing them with insights into a region struck by emerging national conflicts. The strikes and riots of 1936 were covered by a new squad of emigre photographers who had escaped Germany and were on a constant hunt for assignments. In 1948, then, Israel became a major magnet for photographers like Robert Kappa. His friend and colleague David Seymour would then cover uh, the Suez crisis in 1956, where he too was killed in action on November 11th. International photojournalism was decisive in shaping the public image of Israel. By the time of the Six Day War, photojournalists were omnipresent on the Israeli scene. One of them, David Rubinger, would take one of the most important and prominent photography photographs of Israel to date. It shows three paratroopers standing near the Western Wall after entering the old city for the first time. It is taken from a low angle and stages these soldiers as larger than life heroes of a one war. Photojournalism, these different photographers show, was a crucial element in the history of the perception um, and the self-perception of the Jewish state even before it existed. Vishniak stepped into this historic moment of post-Six-Day uh, War euphoria from a very different posi position. While his trip was not entirely for pleasure, in fact, um, we know that he hoped to prepare a publication on Israel. He was not there as a journalist. He was not young or fit enough to visit any kind of war front. He arrived after the war. From what we see, he was not after the most topical images of these days, and yet his images betray a distinct sensitivity for the importance of this moment. The Magnus has cataloged this collection in a way that makes it easy to discern some guiding themes and ideas. And these are Israeli landscapes, its people, and the present moment of the war's aftermath. Landscapes, and I wanna just show you a few of them here, don't play a role in any of his other series in this density. Cityscapes, yes, of cities and towns in Eastern Europe, of Berlin, as we have seen before, and actually also after the war, of New York. But even if we only see the city without its people, these scenes serve as a backdrop for other things, for example, for different actions, for at least storefronts or market stalls or posters. Israel, on the other hand, is encountered by Vishniak through nature, and not just any nature, but the desert. While these are undoubtedly photogenic motifs, they are rather untypical and somewhat anachronistic for the 20th century traveler to Israel and in the wake of the Six Day War. Whereas 19th century visitors with cameras were occupied with the topography of what they encountered as the Holy Land, Photographic gears had soon shifted with the first Jewish and Arab photographers populating the region and mobilizing their cameras in support of emerging discourses of national belonging. National symbols continued to emerge also in the 1960s as Israeli photography focused on progress and on growth. 
Vishniak is not part of this trend. For him, the pioneer of uh, photomicroscopy and uh, biologist, Israel's landscapes, its textures and its properties serve as a key to understanding the country. They offer the most basic starting point, the very beginning to encounter this new world. When we look at some of these first images, we get a very good sense of what Vishniak was after when roaming the desert for images to capture the many colors, textures, and nuances to make the desert come alive through its colors. Vishniak was, of course, by no means the first photographer to use color photography in Israel. One of the first photo books that showed some impressions of the Holy Land in color had been published in 1925, back then with the novel Huvachrome Technology. The use of color by Ludwig Preis, the publisher of the book, came close to what we would estimate to be an intuitive use of color. Preis showed the Dome of the Rock with the colorful tiles, golden spires of Orthodox churches, or the gardens of lush kibbutzim. Back then, color photography was not exactly considered an avant-garde tool. Indeed, it was dismissed by large parts of the Photographers Guild for playing into a conservative, a sentimental trope of pictorial representation. Roland Barthes would later still call it a cosmetic, unable to add to the actual touch of a photograph. This does not seem to bother Vishniak. In withdrawing to the protocols of pictorialism, creating the illusion of a painting, of topographical death, and of a particular aura of the landscape, he seems to hope to invite viewers into these scenes and share this moment with them as authentically as possible. Where to Roland Wald, color in fact reinforced the impression of photographic death and lifelessness. To Vishniak, these colors seem to be able to add life. Many of these landscape photographs are actually taken in portrait format and if to, as if to additionally emphasize the height and the grandeur of these mountains. In browsing these images together with the larger collection, we begin to see that Vishniak seemed to consciously choose to approach 1967 Israel through the desert plains. Because ultimately it is through landscape and with the conventions of landscape photography guiding him that Vishniak approaches Jerusalem, a city marked by war. Through the rubble of the desert, Vishniak encounters the rubble of torn down walls and fences, construction sites of buildings in progress and border zones that have now become roads. Exemplary for this way of encountering the city is this photograph of the torn down Mandelbaum gate, which Vishniak has taken from various angles. The Mandelbaum gate was located on one of the borders of the Jerusalem neighborhood of Musrara, which until 1948 had been shared by Jewish and Arab inhabitants alike. Most of its buildings had been built by wealthy Christian and Muslim families, um, but Jews had soon begun to join them and populate the area as well. After 1948, it became a border zone adjacent to the line dividing the city shaped by barbed wire and mines that were to prevent illegal border crosses. But Musrara would become not merely a border, border zone, but also, as Abigail Jacobson and Moshe Naor have shown in their recent research, a trapped neighborhood caught in the middle between the Arab part and the Israeli state that began west of it, as it began to be settled by Jewish immigrants from Arab countries. The neighborhood would be poorer than other neighborhoods and its inhabitants were not integrated into the rest of the city population. The social challenges and unrest of the neighborhood would form the reason and backdrop to the emerging Israeli Black Panthers movement during the 1970s. Many of Musrara's residents, in fact, felt closer to the population on the other side of the border in East Jerusalem, with whom they interacted across the border. The most important border crossing was the Mandelbaum Gate, which served as a checkpoint between the Israeli 
and the Jordan part of the city. While for diplomats and experts, the gate was merely a formality, for others, especially Israeli Arabs, the crossing was a one-time act as they were often unable to return once they had decided to cross into Jordanian territory. A few days after the war, Jerusalem Mayor Teddy Kollek chose to tear the gate down and with it, its many sad memories of departure and separation. The choice to document the gate and the meaning it has acquired attests to Vishniak's knowledge, maybe intuitive, maybe he learned about it, about the gate and its history. The Mandelbaum gate has become a skeleton here, but it remains coated with the dust of ruins that once formed the border between the both parts of the city. The ruin has become a temporary landmark, attesting to the transient nature of borders in a city that has seen countless battles only days before. Vishniak was no stranger to the photography of rubble and the traces of wars. In Berlin in 1947, he had taken photographs of a war-torn German city. Stephen Hölscher, in his analysis of these photos, has shown that they were often depicted without people, or if they showed some, they were isolated. Just as his Berlin photographs, Vishniak's Jerusalem rubble similarly lacks people, save for some lonely wanderers. In coming to Jerusalem, Vishniak replaces the desert plains with urban no man's land. People remain absent in both. Stefan Ludwig Hoffmann has argued for this kind of photographic genre of ruin or rubble photography to be reflecting an aesthetic distance to the violence of war and separation. And Todd Samuel Pressner has termed such remains, and I quote, testimonies to the multi-layered, non-simultaneous pasts, which are simultaneously sedimented in the time of the present." End of quote. These remains, then, are both remnants and dead, memento mori and witnesses to a history that continues to be written. Israel's landscapes and the topography of a recent war to Vishniak enter a organic relationship and the disaster of war receives some consolation through the existence of the timeless plains of the nearby desert, which remain and will remain as a balance to the ruptures of crisis. Moreover, documenting the destruction of the gate, Vishniak seems to articulate a particular hope for reconciliation, for the end of division. He thereby interprets the end of the war not as a mere victory and the triumph of conquest, but as a chance for the region. In roaming the city, Vishniak repeatedly returns to the border zone around Musrara and East Jerusalem. Walls and rubble continue to shape many more of these images now populated by um, some more inhabitants. See the following photograph, for example, in which a man and a boy take a rest on the remains of what was once a wall. Neither one looks into the camera and Vishniak does not force them to or seeks attention. He chooses to remain an observer from the side. The white Jerusalem stone blinds passers by. It still claims a continued present in the picture in spite of this wall being torn down. Walls continue to be dominant also in the following scenes. Here, for example, off the Damascus gate, and later on when he enters the old city. These scenes here in front of the Damascus gate uh, captured, um, capturing the many visitors passing through the gate, coming from the old city or going there. The gate is illuminated by the afternoon sun. The shadows are long. The stone again begins to adopt its usual evening rose color. Vishniak has taken the photograph from a bit of an elevated point to get a better grasp of the masses in front of them. They are now able to cross between the former east and west of the city. He seems to be on his way to the old city himself because one of the subsequent photographs is this one here taken on the Western Wall inside the old city. 
The image shows the wall and three soldiers who seem to have come together with a little boy. The man in the middle wears a makeshift kippah made of paper as they are still handed out to men today to be worn in close proximity to the wall. This man seems to have something in his hands that occupies them all. Their heads and bodies are turned away from the wall. The image is somewhat of an antidote to David Rubinger's iconic image of the war. In contrast to Rubinger's paratroopers shown earlier and the elation invoked in Rubinger's image, these soldiers are captured in a rather mundane moment of situational interaction. On June 14th, Shavuot holiday, and only four, four days after the war had uh, ended, the wall had been opened to the public, which streamed to the old city to see it. By the end of the holiday, so only two days later, half a million visitors had come. The soldiers are now merely part of a general crowd. Only weeks after the war, the visit to the wall seems to have become a routine task. Other than in Vishniak's desert images in which color serves to highlight the different features of textures and rock formations, the colors in this photograph almost appear bland, unimpressive, and having little to contribute to the overall experience. And yet Vishniak insists on color as if only color is able to present the moment, mundane and historic at the same time. And this is maybe also a good moment to say that the captions are uh, quite reduced in comparison to the many other captions that we heard of today. Here he only says that he took this photo with a yellow Kodak box. Like everyone else in these days exploring newly gained territories, Vishniak is on the move. While Israelis and Palestinians visit the respective other side, to Vishniak everything is new and he seems to enjoy the freedom of movement. Wanderings, not specific sites, are in the center of his work. Exemplary for this impression are the images he takes when leaving Jerusalem, as uh, this one here. The photograph without a caption has been taken in a small town setting. The angle and framing betray the fact that he has taken the photograph maybe from a car or a bus. Some villages are captured passing by across the junction. The atmosphere is calm. A boy runs after a wheel. Other children follow in a distance together with some men who might be going to or coming from the noon prayer as the short shadows suggest. In recreating a moment taken by a tourist and in color, Vishniak seems to seek to diminish the authority of the photographer and invite viewers in, into this image, democratizing the experience of travel in Israel in this very moment of 1967. The blue tinge the photo has acquired over time retroactively adds to the atmosphere of respite and short relaxation before these territories will become contested ground in the subsequent years. Only very rarely does Vishniak choose to take actual portraits. Not more than a handful of such images can be found in the collection. And when he does take portraits, Vishniak seems to be particularly interested in elderly people, people with a profession, a particular background or a story. Children, so present in many of his other series and also in Zionist iconography, are almost absent from his Israel photographs. This worker here, for example, um, is a representative of these photos, of these portraits. He stands self-confidently to be captured and photographed by Vishniak. He smiles and the tan skin glows in the sun. His head protects only a minimum of uh, his head and his khaki pants mirror the earth and grass behind him, making him become one with the landscape around him, of which he seems to be quite proud. This photograph here, in contrast, shows an orthodox man, pensive, not turned to the camera, but concentrated on something else. The wide background provides a white canvas and renders his appearance devoid of anchorage in any specific time or space. Similarly, this portrait of a Samaritan priest who uh, looks straight into the camera and his hand on what seems to be a Torah scroll 
self-confidently guarding the century's old Samaritan tradition. Vishniak has made his way up to Nablus to see him, a way that now in 1967 is possible again and open again. And it allows him to connect with a long tradition of photography of this region and in fact of the Samaritans and Samaritan priests in particular. There are many more photographs from earlier uh, decades of um, this group. The photograph is slightly out of focus, as are several of the photographs in Vishniak's Israel series. In choosing color, he seems to be ready to take this risk. And he actually sort of makes uh, different photographic dis discoveries and, and experiments. And he, yeah, is um, accepting the fact that not all of them uh, turn out perfect. Portraits of this kind remain where Vishniak prefers to capture people from a distance like here as part of the lives they live in 1967. This photograph speaks for the many traits that define Vishniak's works taken during this, this trip and it all situates his gaze somewhat on the margins. The photograph is a sensitive visual account of an evening scene at the Dead Sea. The water is calm, Warm blue, purple, and pink colors render this image a statement of peace between day and night. Like this image, many of Vishniak's Israel photographs offer insights into a moment of transition from the margins, as if to acknowledge his status of a visitor, but also being aware of the important changes the country is undergoing. Vishniak would remain a stranger to this world even if he would return to participate in the first international triennale of photography in Jerusalem in 1973. But he did not truly return to take photographs or publish them. Instead, he returned to a different world, the vanished world, publishing his Eastern European images in the 1983 volume that revived their fame and visibility for coming generations. Much of the history of Israeli photography and Israel in photography is a story of international networks of exchange, cooperation and competition. Vishniak, on the other hand, although not entirely working in a vacuum and in touch with some of his contacts in Israel, roams the land alone or only with his wife, unaffected by trends or topicalities. Israel to him is no replacement of the old world. He does not play into the Zionist ethos of renewal and the ingathering of exiles. There is no pomp and no triumph in these images of 1967. Color photography, usually used to emphasize and corroborate moments of change or progress, here serves to distill the silent shadows and nuances of Israel's timeless landscapes. And yet Vishniak insists on color photography from the more than 450 images that appear in this collection on Israel, there is not a single photograph taken in black and white. Vishniak chose to capture the entirety of his visit in color, which must have meant a considerable expense at the time when color photography still was more costly by far than black and white film. But in spite of this investment, which might have justified a more active and centered capturing of the place, Vishniak stays modestly distant. Literally in the shadow of world politics, as here near the newly erected Knesset building, surrounded once more by rubble, Vishniak remains a sensitive observer of what Israel meant for him in this momentous summer of 1967. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you for this um, really wonderful analysis of this cache of materials that uh, just as a reminder, are, we're seeing for the first time essentially. And we, we, we share them uh, at, at the Magnus yesterday at our open house, we shared some, some of the images specifically from Jerusalem, uh, but uh, you, you gave us a, a great uh, bird's eye view on, on, on everything. Welcome back, Aubrey. Um, I don't see any specific questions for us, which actually gives me a chance to maybe um, ask you. 
Like, actually, no, there is one from just just came in. One for Aubrey. Did the Zionist pre-war European group of Tmuna, to which Vishniak had belonged, ever get revived in Israel? And uh, to that, I would like to add another question, Aubrey, if you can expand a little bit on his artistic connections in uh, Berlin uh, or other significant encounters that you may, may have had that had been shaping uh, his, his views. I know he was in touch with artist uh, Jakob Schleinhardt, for example, uh, whose depictions of, of Eastern European Jewish life are maybe closer to his photographs than, than we may think. And um, I know Ilya Ehrenborg was a visitor to his, to his house, uh, etc. So if you, if you could just give us a, a bit more of the idea of the network, and I think this question from, from, a, from, a, from a participant in our uh, symposium also goes in that direction. Let me begin with the question from the participant. Um, I think, as I mentioned in my presentation, our knowledge of Tmuna is really completely reduced to what we learned from the German Jewish periodicals of the time. And I have uh, begun to research more in detail all of the names of the individuals involved who gave lectures. And it is rather shocking and very sad to learn that many of them did not manage to emigrate and leave Germany, but uh, perished, were deported and, and perished then uh, in the East. Um, I have to say that I was kicking myself a little bit in preparation um, after I had uh, delved deeper into the history of Tmuna because I was able to ascertain that Thea Prince, the uh, sister of uh, Joachim Prince, um, she became Thea Goldman. She spent a, a very, very short period of time in Palestine and then re-emigrated to Europe in 1947 and settled in Switzerland where she became a well-known portrait photographer. And she passed away in 2012. Um, and that meant that if I had actually so done the homework back then in 2005, there would have been a living member or at least a living individual who had given a presentation at Tmuna. Um, where we may have been able to find out more. I'm 100% convinced that there is no one left alive um, who was involved on that level. Possibly what would be interesting is, is if there could be people alive who as youngsters or teenagers um, maybe saw the exhibition, for example, on their way to a theater performance at the Kulturbund. Um, I tried to get a hold of Felicia Guggenheim's son, Hans Guggenheim, who's now 98, but uh, Ben told me yesterday, I asked Ben um, about the family connection there, and Ben told me that Hans is still alive, but unfortunately um, no longer um, able to communicate. It was, I, I did not succeed in getting a hold of him. So there's still a lot of questions to be answered. Um, there's no indication whatsoever that any individual connected to Tmuna then reestablished the group um, in Palestine, Israel. Um, one of the members uh, was uh, Fritz Eschen, who gave a lot of uh, courses in photography as well. And he survived in Berlin uh, by living in a mixed marriage and became a very well-known uh, theater photographer and continued his career as a photojournalist in Berlin. Um, and again, and as I mentioned also, he reconnected with, with Roman, but I spoke to his son also in advance of our symposium to ask him whether he had ever heard of Tmuna, if his father had ever talk, spoken about it. And that unfortunately was also not the case. So there's still work to be done there. Um, and hopefully hopefully some bits and pieces will, will come up. Um, with regard to uh, Vishniak's connection to artistic circles, I, I really can't talk at, at any great length about that. That really is beyond my knowledge. Again, Francesco, I have to say that I'm so curious to delve deeper into the collection here at the Magnus, because there may be answers there uh, to so many of the questions that have been raised today uh, by, by throughout, throughout our symposium. And there is a lot of unexplored material, the documentary material, which I've, which I've never seen, I never had access to at ICP. So um, hopefully uh, it'd be absolutely wonderful that the collection will be made accessible to uh, researchers everywhere. And then we can uh, together start to pose the questions and to try and find answers to some of them. But I do know also, it is interesting that you mentioned Jakob Steinhardt because uh, Steinhardt also uh, lived in an adjoining building to Roman and uh, there is mention of, of them definitely knowing each other quite well. I think we have to then um, imagine that he was very well connected with uh, a number of the artists who were 
and Russian emigre artists who were passing through Berlin. Berlin was very much a transitory city um, uh, at the time. Michael Brenner mentioned also in his presentation this morning of the flourishing also of Hebrew literature. Well, there was also a flourishing also of, uh, of Yiddish publications, a lot of them done by publishers who had come from uh, from the East, uh, from Russia, and in part from, from Warsaw and Poland as well. But it was a very, it was a very short-lived flourishing of, uh, of, 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 of Russian emigre, Yiddish, and Hebrew literature. The publishing houses existed between 22 and, and 24, one of the most famous being Klal, and then moved on. Many of them then uh, emigrated further to the West, to, to Paris. Thank you, Aubrey. And Rebecca, if, if you uh, could go back a little bit, you, you gave us some very interesting ideas about the, the use of color versus black and white photography. And as you can imagine, that's something that as we, as I was processing this discussion materials, I was very interested in. And uh, two thoughts, and I just wanted to know what, what, you, what you think about these. But one is that actually, uh, as you showed, most of what we know of, the, of Jerusalem in those days and the Six Day War is all in black and white. So these images in some way stand out from, from let's say the canon of that moment in time and, 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 and in place. And the other is wondering whether actually the, the sort of the wealth of a, an American and a US based uh, Roman Vizniak gave him the opportunity to just uh, take photo, take slides rather than think about printing photographs. I suspect by looking at the f at the frames of the slides that they were marked in certain ways. There were probably some that were used in presentations that he gave, uh, so so they were actually reactivated in in, uh, in lectures, and and uh, after, uh, upon his return. Uh, but um, I'm wondering whether you know it's it's a choice or simply an opportunity or simply in his case just a default to take images quickly and and whether this could really have been a scouting trip, preparing for a different project that could have been in black and white. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for these questions. And I, I agree with you that it's a, a very intriguing collection. And um, I wanna uh, sort of start with the last question because I think that, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, this um, is, is proven sort of by the fact that he's somewhat just, um, yeah, um, trying to trying out different things, right? I mean, he takes photographs of Haifa by night, where we don't almost see anything but like a few dots of lights where we understand, uh, okay, so this is really uh, like a trial and error sort of uh, way of taking photographs. Uh, it's an interesting way of taking photographs, but so unusual to what we know of him, uh, both in his um, uh, photo microscopy and also in his Eastern European photographs where every shot seems to be spot on and really um, bringing us so near and so close to the people he encounters. In Israel, he's, he's constantly sort of, um, yeah, taking a step back. And um, we can, of course, not know entirely what he was thinking, but he was so interested in these desert plains. He was trying so hard to get out all the nuances uh, from these desert mountains and hills, for example, and also of different archaeological sites even um, stones at uh, shores and trying to get some animals into the pictures and really almost ignoring people, which is so untypical of him. And so um, it seems that this, yeah, that this series on Israel uh, was maybe part of uh, a larger uh, trip or, or like, like a trip to, to, to grasp Israel and to explain Israel beyond what was visible in Life magazine at the time, beyond what uh, people published in very shiny and glossy magazine, you know, magazines or books. So it's somewhat of an antidote, antidote to this. And it's funny that color photography, the dafka, so to say in Hebrew, uh, serves uh, as a way to make this distinction. Um, and so, yes, I, so I think these, these stand out in, in a very particular way. And uh, whether it has to do with him being an American observer, I'm not sure. I would say that he was certainly aware of what was happening. I mean, he had published in Life magazine before, for example, 
but um, this seems like a choice to maybe also stay somewhat private. I mean, he was later part of this photographic tree analysis, so he did have the contact, but I would actually be intrigued to find out more about his reason to come to Israel and has, um, yeah, the context that made this trip possible, and maybe it will be possible to see some of the conversations he had with, um, for example, Nitsan Peretz. I know he was in contact with um, the curator of the photo uh, collection of the Israel Museum and some others, and I would love to sort of delve deeper into these conversations to see what he was after during this trip. Thank you, thank you very much. There is uh, one last question that I can answer directly from, uh, from our co-panelist, uh, Michael Bremer, who, who is asking whether Vishniak ever went back to Berlin after the war, and he sure did. We were actually showing images of his 1947 uh, trip on assignment uh, by the Jewish Daily Forward to Berlin, and they're stunning images. We, we showed them digitally at the Magnus at the Open House yesterday and we will be sharing more of those some of those were published and included in the in a Venice Roman Vision and Rediscovered project by Maya Benton um, and um, there is a lot more to build on that and a lot of more to build as we learn in this panel in going towards uh, the exploration of the less known or in the case of Israel completely unknown never seen before work of Roman Vision so thank you both very very much and I know John Efron is probably ready to to come and help us uh, wrap up our symposium. Um, here's John. I sure am. Thank you very much uh, to, to both of you for these really interesting papers. And, and they were just a perfect way, I think, to, to conclude. Um, what I will say is that, first of all, I wanna thank all of the speakers for such an exhilarating day. Uh, ordinarily, I'd be tempted to say that they exceeded my expectations, uh, but they didn't. I invited these people because I knew exactly the kind of scholars that they are and what they would present. Same and, here. Uh, and they did. I mean, they were just they were just wonderful. And they were also um, the product of serious research and the, the exercise and the task that they took that was set before them to present here. They took seriously and earnestly. And the upshot is, is that we have now, I think, um, you know, sort of a more fully developed, uh, pun intended, uh, you know, picture of uh, Vishniak, uh, his life and his work. Uh, we've also been given a glimpse, no more, but a, but a glimpse uh, into his character. And uh, based on what I've heard today, uh, there's, a, there's a somewhat enigmatic quality to the man that only makes him even more uh, intriguing. Um, he was a clearly, and I think we got from, from Ben Schiff, a clearly a deeply interested man and a curious man. Uh, and those are characteristics that only make him all the more interesting. Um, a symposium such as this is, among other things, um, an invitation to go further. Um, the history of uh, Jews and photography is... Um, an avenue of research that in some respects is sort of in its infancy. It's not something that, that many modern Jewish historians, for example, or, or, or people involved in, in Jewish culture have really done much research on. Um, and Vishniak was such a singular force, uh, a figure of such uh, dominant a dominant cultural force that he's often presented in some respects as a sort of a solitary figure. And as such, uh, I think we would do well to integrate him uh, into the work that is being done on the Jews and photography. You know, if we go back, some of the work that's been done, older work, Tim Gadal, Helmut Gernsheim, and sort of more recently, people like Michael Berkowitz and David Schneer uh, have written some aspects of the history of photography, an area in which Jews were actually ubiquitous is something that's not very widely known. That has begun to begun, but a new group of scholars in Israel and Rebecca, who I'm delighted we were able to have here with us, is part of a new group of scholars who are paving the way uh, in that area. And I would like to think that um, the Magnus's Vishniak archive will prove a valuable source, a resource for scholars uh, uh, writing the fascinating history of Jews and photography, and not just 
uh, his Israel stuff, but perhaps seen through the lens or the eyes, let me just say, of this new group of scholars in Israel, even some of the other stuff as well might shed, uh, you know, might shed uh, new light on, on his work. And it will hopefully be able to, I think, uh, contextualize Vishniak further. And instead of being presented, as I say, as a solitary figure, although a celebrated one, it's not like he wasn't known, uh, but the Vishniak will become uh, one, uh, albeit, titanic figure in a much larger modern Jewish cultural enterprise, that being photography. Um, and so I, what I want to do is I just again thank our presenters and our moderators uh, for making it the day it was. Um, because um, the day and the technology has gone uh, so smoothly, it all looks, I'm sure, to uh, the at one point there were 134 people watching you know we're, we're, we're now down to 97 which is still a pretty big audience uh it must appear as though oh this looks pretty simple to have been to, to put on uh it wasn't uh, i can assure you of that a tremendous amount of work and and i thank them in the beginning of the day and i and i just want to thank them again i want to thank the uc berkeley office of uh, uh development and alumni relations uh Carl and Silwick and Julie Oliver, and I want to thank um, uh, our staff at the Magnus, um, Laura, Laura Bratt, Etta Haber, Jennifer Lipscomb, and uh, Marjorie Lightman, and, uh, and uh, Deborah Banks, who before she left us was part of this implementation committee. Uh, their work uh, made it the day that it was. And uh, if you have all out there enjoyed it half as much as I have, then it's been a day well spent. And so I thank you for your attention and I invite you to come to the Magnus and not just to, to see the Vishniak collection, but much else besides. Uh, there is just a, a, it's a treasure and it's a treasure worth, uh, worth viewing and learning about and uh, going there and um, being delighted by. So um, that's, my, that's my closing remarks to you. Come to, come to the, uh, I'm to the Magnus. And thank you, John. Thank you for having the idea, the inspiration to, to hold this symposium and to really start moving, as Barbara said at one point in her, in her introductory words, really moving uh, Magnus and, and the work that we do around the Vishniak Archive in a, in a whole different direction. So thank you very, very much to you as well. Thank you. So I wish you all a good evening. Uh, yes. Rebecca, I wish you a Layla Tov. So, thank you. Rebecca uh, is in the middle of the night there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Goodbye.